first of all, because I wasn't there, um, just any questions that may have gone over my mind. Um, so there's one thing that, so what, what I wanted to do is just to finish the path integral part of these pre-gauge theory by doing fermions and how fermions are incorporated in path integrals. But before I do that, what we finished is sort of real scalar fields. And, uh, but the hanging thing, the thing that was not satisfactorily dealt with up till now, has been the, the question, to, the, the sense in which what we're doing is uh, rigorous as a path integral or is it fast and loose um, is it some sort of mnemonic, some more discretized picture, and so on? And, and indeed, everything we've done, you can think of as absolutely rigorous if you, if you were only to sort of... Um, so our manipulations... Hours and uh, sorry, um, years of calculus, doing functional calculus, and establishing whether everything was rigorous or not. The way we did epsilon delta proofs for the way we learned calculus, right? So, and yet, everything we've done can be just thought of as manipulations on multiple integrals if. So basically, um, if you just imagine in all those manipulations that we did, that space, space was a lattice, time, instead of being continuous, was a series of discrete instants, then you quickly see that what we called this integral d5 is just a product over discrete space-time instants and sort of multiple integral of the sort. D5, okay? That is, everything we did turns into something like this, and even the number of integrals that we're doing, for example, if time, we're going from time initial to time final, then there's a finite number of time instants, if I've discretized, I say the smallest unit of time is one second. And similarly for space, there's a finite number of spatial points. If I have chosen a smallest distance, space is a lattice, so there's a lattice spacing, and a largest distance, which is to say the universe returns to its own, basically the universe is in a box of some sort. Okay. Then we have just manipulated things of this sort. And what have we lost? We've lost Lorentz invariance by doing this, because I've chosen a lattice which has some rest frame and so on. Okay. Um, but the idea would be that the, the lattice 
spacing. You can think of the lattice spacing as corresponding to just a UV regulator or cutoff, ultraviolet cutoff, lambda. So the lattice spacing A, usually called A. So when you have fields that live on a lattice, the smallest momentum, the smallest wavelength you can have is of order the lattice spacing. And that means that the highest momentum you can have, or highest energy, if it's a lattice in time, the highest energy and momentum you can have is 1 over the lattice spacing. So you've introduced a cutoff. Okay? And as I said, every cutoff comes with its own choice of poison. Otherwise, you could think it's the real theory. Um, Pauli Villars, you chose the wrong statistics. If you could actually produce a real Pauli Villars, if you had the energy to produce Pauli Villars particles, you would have violated the spin statistics there. Um, here, if you have wavelengths that can really, if you have experimental wavelengths, if you have the energy to produce very short wavelengths at very high frequencies, you would be able to see the lattice experimentally and say, oh my gosh, I don't really live in a relativistic world. I live in a lattice world which has only got some sort of emergent relativity at long wavelengths. When I'm not aware of the lattice spacing, I have this new symmetry called Lorentz invariance. Just like in a bath of water, which looks roughly rotationally symmetric, if I could only get wavelengths short enough, I could see that it's made out of hydrogen H2O molecules. And I can see that fundamentally this medium is not rotationally symmetric. Okay? But for long wavelengths, you don't need to know that. It looks pretty rotate. You take a bath of water into outer space, it looks rotationally symmetric in all its properties. Okay. So we can think of this lattice spacing as just the breakdown of translation invariance, of continuous translation invariance, the breakdown of rotational invariance, the breakdown of Lorentz invariance by the lattice as merely the particular choice of poison we've chosen that goes with an ultraviolet regularization of quantum field theory. So I want to say that two problems are just one problem. It's not that there's no problem. There's one problem. The one problem is that all these manipulation of functional integrals, da 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 da, are perfectly sensible manipulations of a finite number of multiple integrals. You can follow every step I did by just thinking in this language. Okay? And you can think of this as a mnemonic. But the sense in which you don't even need to care about the lattice spacing, to say that the lattice spacing, I might as well take the lattice spacing to zero, that there's a limit in which the lattice spacing goes to zero. Just like the generalization of the notion of derivative, right? The lattice spacing goes to zero. Is the same question of, am I sensitive to my ultraviolet regulator or not? Are my physical predictions sensitive to the ultraviolet regulator if my experimental wavelengths are much larger than the lattice spacing. Even though they're much larger, is there some way that the lattice spacing dependence shows up in all my answers and, 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 and tells me, and, ki and kicks me out of the illusion that I'm in a relativistic uh, universe? But that is precisely the question of ultraviolet dependence, of the renormal, so called, the, the question that we're going to come to, which is the renormalizability of a theory, the sense in which. All the ultraviolet dependence can be got rid of. All the sensitivity to which UV regulator we chose can be got rid of by renormalization, which we've seen an instance of in the case of uh, the self-energy. But if we can extend that program to cover the most general types of amplitudes and say that in terms of some finite number of inputs which I can fit to experiment, I can predict everything in this theory, that every question the theory allows me to ask can be answered in a way that's insensitive to the manner of regularization. Then I have done what, you know, whatever, not Newton or Leibniz or whoever it was, did for calculus. I've shown the insensitivity to the limiting procedure. I've shown that there is a limit. Okay. So this is the hanging question. You might have thought, well, I knew that there was this question of the normalizability that was to come. But then I was also worried about these path intervals and whether they made sense and that sort of thing that way. 
but I want to say it's the same. We can think of it as the same question. In fact, even Pauli Villar's regularization can be thought of as a, I won't do this in front of you, but can be thought of as a way, ask me offline, but can be thought of as a way of turning this abstract notion of functional integral um, into a kind of multiple integral. Okay. Um, it's not quite as pictorially obvious as using a lattice regularization, but only a little bit more abstract than that. I mean, it's easy to do. So, I'm not doing it. so in some way or another, regularization or ultraviolet regularization is equivalent to questioning really, did we mean what we said here literally as this is a new construction? And, uh, and the answer is uh, yes, for a, for a large class of theories, the theories which can be made ultraviolet insensitive. Okay, okay so that is uh, collapsing at least two questions down to one, which we are soon to attack. Before I do that, I just wanted to do the case of fermionic path integrals so that we have done everything pre-gauge theory, and then we'll attack the normalizability or the question of ultraviolet sensitivity in the most general sort of way of thinking, and then we'll be ready to do gauge theory as the final part of this course. Yes, but there was another question. The question was whether the calculus can be defined or not, because uh, we assume that for small lattice spacing, the changes are small, but uh, you never address the question, what, uh, how can we say that changes are small from? No, no, so, um, in fact, the changes are not small. Yes, exactly. So that means. And, and this is also true. So let me try and rephrase the question. I mean, let me phrase the question and then try and say that you're asking a good question. The question is not easily dismissed. But it is the same question that I am saying is to be dealt with in, in what's to come. That is, when you do these, um, so let me first start with polyvolars again. Okay, so it's just the way we are used to doing loop diagrams, which is using momentum space. Polyvolars is a nice, you can sort of see it as a kind of a soft cutoff in momentum space. Okay, and indeed, when you have some loop momentum, and uh, and you have the you know the, the diagram plus some polyvolars or minus some polyvolars diagram like this, um, when you're doing this loop diagram, you find that it is extremely it, 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 let's suppose this was a naively divergent. So this is a divergent diagram. A diagram, if you didn't regulate it, this would be ill-defined. So it's only well-defined because you combine like this and then do the integral. Well, not surprisingly, this integral is incredibly sensitive to the nature of that regularization. If you were to change the pauli velars mass scale by a factor of two, the answer you get would change by 100%. Okay? So you could say, the the um, if you, this this momentum is secretly describing uh, the quantum the, the field the field in these path angles right um, so it is about as wrinkly as this cutoff is allowing it to be right in other words the, the, the you cannot say that the loop momentum is somehow smooth on the scale of 1 over lambda, mm -hmm. or on length scales of order 1 over lambda. This virtual momentum, again, whose momentum is it? It's the momentum of some quantum field in this path integral. It is as rough as this thing will allow it to be. Namely, it's, it's, as, it's, as, it's got wavelengths of order 1 over lambda, or momenta of order lambda. This thing is dominated, this integral is dominated by momenta of order the cutoff, right? Now, let me come to this case. 
I'm trying to first say I agree with you in terms of what the data is, okay? It's the interpretation where I'm disagreeing. Here, too, if I do Feynman diagrams, I'm saying it in perturbative terms, if I do Feynman diagrams, I will find that these momenta, this, this momentum is very sensitive to this lattice spacing. In fact, the only reason that the momentum gets cut off in any way is because once I get to wavelengths of order A, there's no, there's no notion of a shorter wavelength when you live on a lattice. And so I'm very, very sensitive to it. Okay? The question is, is my, sens uh, is my sensitivity to this regularization absorbable into some finite number of measurements? I'm very sensitive to it, and I don't know what the answer is, but I just go measure five things. They are very, very sensitive to A. But in terms of those five things, I can predict everything else. Right? If you remember back to how renormalization worked in self-energy, once we had done mass and wave function renormalization, and especially in the homework one, those exercises you did, you found that once you had, if you like, fit, take, take the, especially in homework two, in the first part of homework two, where you're sort of really trying to think like an experimentalist, once you have gone and measured enough physical quantities and, and traded the bare parameters for the renormalized parameters or the, parameter, or the measurements you've made, in terms of the renormalized parameters, there's no further sensitive, there's no sensitivity to the cutoff. But if you go at it directly and just say, let me just calculate all diagrams, how sensitive am I to the lattice or how sensitive am I to polypolars? The answer is, you're incredibly sensitive, and there's no sense in which the quantum field is smooth on the scale of the lattice spacing. So it seems like this lattice spacing is not, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a standard thing when we think about discretization, where you say, look, I have a function which I know looks like this. For some reason, I know that the scales on which it's varying are, say, one meter then how could it possibly hurt me to just say that space is not continuous? I will use millimeter. I will just use a millimeter lattice. Because the millimeter lattice is so fine on the scale, which I know the physics is, or whatever the picture is. Our situation is subtler than that. The quantum fluctuations, the virtual momenta, this field contains all contains the real the real momenta, the experimental momenta as well as, well as the virtual momenta. Is as it's as jagged as the cutoff you put in. This seems very, very dangerous. Right? I'm, that, I'm, I'm trying to give voice to your question. This seems very, very dangerous. It's not the usual way where we use a lattice to discretize a picture that is essentially smooth. Pre, 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 it's given to us as something smooth, and we just digitize it in this way. It's as horrible as can be. And yet, the magic that we're after is to say that you choose a lattice cutoff, I choose Pauli Villars, you choose a lattice which is twice as big, or you choose a square lattice, I choose a rectangular lattice, a triangular lattice. This, that, there are all these choices. And, and these fields are sensitive to them, but they're sensitive to them in a finite number of ways, which you can measure whatever is really happening in nature, whatever is that lattice in the sky, um, whatever it is, I just measure a handful of quantities, which are very sensitive to it. I calculate all other quantities in terms of these handful of sensitive quantities, and that dependence is insensitive to the cutoff. Okay? That is the subtle thing that's happening, which you are not familiar with when you digitize a photo. That, and, 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 and I'm saying that's hanging. That's not, not, I'm not told. I've, I've given you one example of how that works. But 
I have not, and in fact, maybe a useful thing is, if you, re, if you want, you can go through the self-energy story using, instead of Pauli Villars, you can use like a lattice, a lattice cutoff, and you can see what happens. Um, it's not a bad existence. Yes, but this jagged picture is true in quantum mechanics as well, where we do not have these ultraviolet infinities. It's true, and in fact, there, there's something even better, which is that, so, there are the set of theories that we are trying to get to in this course, although I will try and point out things beyond this set, but the classic set that we're trying to get to is the set of renormalizable theories, where there are a finite number of ways in which amplitudes depend strongly on the cutoff. Once we measure a finite number of experimental quantities, we can trade our lack of knowledge of the ultraviolet cutoff for just having measured our way past it. Okay? How many such sensitivities are there will determine how many measurements we need to take from experiment as inputs in order to predict everything else as an output. In quantum mechanics, uh, or rather in the standard types of quantum mechanics, uh, that you've come across, the number of such ultraviolet sensitivities turns out to be zero. So, and we will we'll categorize some of these things. We'll see that there are different possible, how do you, how do you guess how many different types of ultraviolet sensitivities you have? We'll, we'll see how to do it. But in quantum mechanics, the, you've never come across this issue because the number of different types of ultraviolet sensitivity, in other words, things are better than in field theory, and the number of sensitivities is, is zero. Um, in a certain sense, this is also true in string theory, that it's better than the renormalizable theories that I'll be teaching you about, in the sense that the number of ultraviolet divergences, we would have been happy with measuring a few things, but uh, to, 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 to bypass the ultraviolet sensitivity, but in fact we don't have any ultraviolet. Um, so, I want to consider that a sort of degenerate case of field theory. In fact, often field theorists will talk about zero plus one dimensional quantum field theory, otherwise known as quantum mechanics. So, we think of quantum mechanics as this kind of baby case of quantum field theory. But it's true that there is this kind of behavior going on, and yet the, 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 the sensitivity to it is provably not present. You're not, you have nothing that's sensitive. Yeah. Um, just since you mentioned string theory, do you know if in string field theory you get new issues with infinite like like cutoff things? Because string theory is, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like the analog they say is it's like your second quantized in string theory. But. Um, okay, so <coughs> I'm not a super expert on string field theory, but uh, I know some little bit about it, and I know more about something which is very similar to string field theory, and I am an extremely good guesser. So, <laughs> let me put all that together and ask, and ask that first, I'm not looking at the camera, uh, string field theory is to some extent a kind of a Frankenstein monster. Um, it is, you know, I, I won't go through the history of it, but obviously it was a way to try and break out of perturbative string theory uh, construction. It, it, <coughs> in general, the case where you want to have string field theory, string theory, you want to have it because it's a theory of quantum gravity. In the case where string field theory can be thought of as a theory of quantum gravity, um, the formulation requires you, so I'm going to say it fast, to kind of look up the answers that you get perturbatively and uh, by, by sort of first quantized string theory and kind of um, make the string field theory reproduce those answers. So it's like looking up the answer in the back of the book rather than having sort of an independent formulation with a finite sort of set of rules that, that does everything for you. So the reason it avoids divergences is because 
it is copying the answers <laughs> from the first quantized formulation, which beautifully has a reason why it does not have algebraic choice. The, uh, the, the quick mantra in, in string theory is that in place, all, ultra, all places where normally you would see ultraviolet divergences, the ultraviolet divergences turn out to secretly be infrared divergences. And infrared divergences are always not a problem. They merely have to be understood. And um, this beautiful ultraviolet infrared trade is sort of a key feature of string theory, um, which you get no hint of, really, in, um, in standard field theory, or at least in perturbative field theory. Uh, of course, since there are non-perturbative field theories which are dual to string theories, uh, then you know, field theory has this magic secret. So, so. Uh, enough said about that. Okay, so, so I want to do the, the, the warm-up to um, fermionic fields. Uh, the kind of Dirac fields that we use in QED are, uh, are intrinsically complex fields. And not only that, they obey Fermi statistics. But I first want to just tackle the <coughs> fact that they're complex fields, whereas we have sort of been treating real scalar fields up till now. And so the baby way of getting to the word complex Fermi fields is to just deal with complex scalar fields and just almost for notation, not because it's the slightest tricky thing about them, but only, I'd say almost for notational reasons. Okay, so here's the quick, I hope quick uh, introduction to complex scalar fields. The reason it's really absolutely not got any new features is because a complex number complex, can be written as a sum of, I mean, a pair of real numbers. A complex field can be written, can be thought of as a pair of real fields. So how difficult can it get? Okay, so that's why I said it's mostly notational. But uh, this will speed us up in the case of fermions. So let's, let's do it. Um, so here's a regular integral over two real variables, I mean numbers, two real numbers, okay? Not even fields. Uh, I'll make it a kind of Gaussian with some coefficient, which I'll just call d, by which I just mean some c number. So that's a Gaussian, and let's just do the typical kind of manipulation. This is like a linear term in X. You can think of it as a source in X. This is just a, this is not a field theory. This is just a two-dimensional integral, Gaussian integral. And you could have a source, in quotes, source term for Y. And we recognize now, I don't have to keep going through the whole litany, but know why we're doing integrals of this form. So now I'm just taking a pair of such things, that's all. Of course we've been doing multiple things. But I want to I want to associate this pair in this sense to think of something to, to warm up to complex fields. Um, and so we, we know what to do here. We can complete the square and uh, and write x plus uh, much, so we have subtract, um, add, subtract, add, 
subtracting j x squared over d to mu um, So, this is then proportional to, that is, as we know, everything that didn't involve the source, once I shift, I, I call this x prime and this y prime and I call this, this is, this is equal to dx prime, dy prime, clearly. So therefore, it is proportional to e to the jx 1 over d to the jx plus jy. Okay. And, you know, this d could be imaginary, I don't know. This is the answer. So I've done this problem just thinking of x and y as two. And the, the problem is totally fine. Obviously, I'm just this is just the square of a one-dimensional problem. Because exponentials add. Okay, so not very clever of me, but there, I've done it. Now um, <coughs> So can be, so as I said, this is partly notational. Here's the main notation. There is a kind of notation that's more or less standard in certain circles, uh, where instead of writing, you know, this is not a contour integral. It's an integral over the plane. But instead of writing integral dx dy, I can write it as integral dz and dz star. The central thing you have to absorb is the notation where you think of z and its complex conjugate as independent variables. You treat them for a certain set of manipulations as if they were independent variables, which they're not. Z star, if I know z, I know z star. So, you know, this notation is almost to be thought of in quotes. Okay? That's the only new thing that this section involves. But if you think of this as really just, it really means this dx and dy, you will see the, why this kind of mnemonic device is, is useful. Because I can write this expression here as e to the minus, um, Oh, yes, it's infinity e because I need to put that. Okay. Um, then I can write this as z, z star, d. And this, you can show, <laughs> I can write as j star, uh, here, j star z plus j z star where I define j to be jx. So I make a complex source to match my complex uh, integration variable, like so. Okay. And again, in the spirit of pretending that the complex conjugate variable is independent of this, the, the, the original variable, um, I will write down the obvious. What we're going to do is try and think of J and J star as sort of independent sources, although notationally we're recognizing they're really complex conjugates of each other, just to match this, again, fiction that Z and Z star are independent. Okay. But what I've written is literally true from here, as long as we accept this notation that DZ, DZ star is DX and Y. Okay. Yeah. Um. So when I've seen this before, they usually put a Jacobian in front of the J, Z, Z, Z star. Uh, you write like Z equals X plus I, Y, and Z star is X minus I, Y, and you get like 2 over I or something like that. I don't know. Um, I well, we shouldn't get any, I mean, 
So I have I have a root to hopefully sure, I Sure, yeah, so that, that'll probably go away, but it, usually there's a factor by. Um, let's see, suppose I thought of it in terms of this. Um, suppose I wrote the x plus <coughs> i, y. I want to take it, so for people who know what that is, um, then this would not even seem like something to be put in quotes. You would just write this. same reason I don't care about that proportionality constant, but that would be then the literal truth of the language of these forms, okay, the integration method form. For those who are less familiar with that way of thinking, um, I'll stick with that, okay, because the main thing that I want to do at this stage is um, the main thing that I want to do is to get used to the idea of completing the square and just thinking of the z and the z star as independent. And so what I can do here is write this as equal to um, integral z, z, z to z star and uh, e to the <coughs> minus. Component um, plus J one over D J star. Okay. And I define this as Z prime and used to is, you just want to save time, uh, doing this manipulations of completing the square to do your Gaussian integrals, um, doing it at the level of the complex variable rather than painfully breaking up into real terms. Okay. Because when we think of the Dirac matrices that come into QED, they're complex. So they're complex numbers floating everywhere. And it would be a real pain in the neck keep breaking things down into real bits and pieces. Okay, so we need to just move fast at this level. Um, so, so it checks out. And um, indeed, when you take a function, when you take a derivative with respect to j, pull down as a z star. Okay. So when we go to the level of field theory, there'll be a j and a complex field phi star. You take a functional derivative with respect to j, you'll pull down a phi star. 
but this will allow you to, by taking functional derivatives with respect to j star and j, you will or automatically get time ordered products of phi and phi star, rather than breaking it up into real and imaginary parts of the complex field. Okay, that's the only virtue of this. Um, so let's do that complex field. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yep. Does, does d have to be real or <coughs> Um, I think I've written it here for the case where it's real, but you could imagine, so indeed, it does not have to be, um, but I've done it like a Gauss, I've written it here like in some weird, something unrealistic, unrelated to physics, just because it's math. Better, I did it like a Gaussian. If you want, the real case would actually have an e to the i, something or other, but it would have the i epsilon, the famous i epsilon, which is actually giving the kind of convergence factor that we like. And so it would really be a mix. It would be complex. Yeah, keep the epsilon. It would be a complex. But you can go through this manipulation. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, with the i epsilon, it should converge without the epsilon, just the e to the i, right? That's I think in the sense, you know, I'm not a super expert on that, but I would have said, I would have waved my hands and said wild phase cancellation or large integration variables should have made it converge. Um, fortunately, in perturbation theory, I don't have to deal with that. Um, okay, so so let's just write what this thing is for a complex scalar field. Um, so, this whole set of manipulations goes to the notion of integral d phi, d phi star, where phi is a complex field, and it is a function, it is made out of two real fields, and j is a complex source, and it is made out of two real sources where okay but then we would write path rules that look like um, This could be a differential operator, for example, d mu. Okay, just doing free field theory, it would just look like that. Um, oh, I forgot some sort of. So again, I continue with this fiction of the, of course it's really a potential, so it's a function of phi 1 and phi 2. If I just write this, that's already phi 1 plus i phi 2, so. But this is a useful fiction because it allows me to write analytic functions of phi and phi star. In other words, an example of this could have just been phi 1 plus i phi 2 absolute value to the fourth. <coughs> That's an example. But these absolute value things look so non-analytic, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they do. And it's often just easier on the brain to note that this could have been written as phi phi star Um, and the kind of manipulations, you see, why would you care? Because in perturbation theory, this comes down, and you're doing Gaussian integrals. 
And it's just easier to think of phi and phi star because functional differentiation with respect to these sources. Um, functional differentiation with respect to these sources corresponds to phi and phi star rather than phi 1 and phi 2 or the absolute value of phi or any other other thing. Um, this could be a more complicated differential operator like if Took a complex scalar field, we can do comp we can do scalar QED, um, where you remember the rule for QED would be where where this is equal to d mu minus i e a mu. We'll come back to gauge theory for our second look at it, but you've seen this already to some extent. This rule, and uh, so this could be a more interesting operator than just this. But the main thing I'm telling you to get used to is just thinking of the phi and the phi star as these sort of pseudo-independent variables and just continuing to work in terms of them as independent variables formally. as just a quick way of doing these Gaussian integrals that is all that we have to do in perturbation. <coughs> um, So, the central completing the square result if I just do the free case we've seen how the perturbation theory so let me perturbation theory is just knowing, knowing how to do this integral here. So what is it? Um, um, is proportional to And this is just the analog of 1 over d there. It's the, of course, it's the Green's function. If it's just this thing, it's just the Feynman propagator. Uh, just some factor of a pi, which you can go and work out if you can. Um, but you can think of it as the inverse of that, meaning that this, this operator acting on this is a delta function. Okay, so I'm just saying, this is what you're used to seeing for real path integrals. It goes ahead in this way for this. For people who are really keeping track of the factors of two, there's no two here in the way we usually define these fields. Because they actually, if you write that out in terms of real and imaginary, it corresponds to the two there. Um, and indeed, in the action, there's no so here, there's no two here. Because when you unpack what the z is and write it like this, then there's a two in terms of the real pieces. So the normalization, canonical normalization of kinetic terms. For real fields, there's always a half in front of everything in the kinetic term. And for complex fields, there isn't. Just because it's absorbed into this. Okay, so this is the, just as I say, almost notational issue, and now we actually have to do the harder part, which is um, spinner uh, fields and firm fields. Um, and the, the, the tough question, and it is a tough question, is we, how, do we, how do we capture the Fermi statistics? And um, in a 
this sense, canonically, the canonical scalar field operator turned out to be this Heisenberg field This is the object that is canonical field theorist we've been manipulating in various ways up till now. And it turned into two things which were not operators. Or rather, there are two aspects of it that came out in everything we've recently done, which are not operators, they're C numbers. And one is this phi of x, which is just a C number field, in which is the path integral. Integration. I shouldn't really say path, I should say functional integration. Variable. So it's an integration variable and it's just a C number. And then the other thing is the source. The thing which you tickle in order to get all the answers from just the vacuum for every other correlator that you want. Okay? So, which is also, and these are both uh, C, C number fields. So the great virtue of the Feynman path integral is it took this highly abstract notion of functional integral, I mean of, of, of uh, quantum operator, and turned them into absolutely average looking fields no sense of quantum operator about them. The price you paid was path integration. But even that is just ordinary integration if you discretize space time. And in any case, you have to do something like discretize space time or put in the shortest wavelength just because other, as an intermediate step to renormalization. So you know, in the case of field theory, hardly a cost. Uh, it had to be done anyway, necessarily that you can write this language all you want, and it's a highly formal thing, because uh, there are ultraviolet divergences even in the canonical approach to, to doing everything. So anyway, this is the trade-off between the two. But now, this of course had, I guess now it is, it counts as lower case, uh, both statistics. And now we want to go, we want to ask, so we have the Fermi statistics in there. And we want to know who is the path integration variable and who is the source. So the source is usually called, so this is the source, usually called eta. Strictly, we never impose both statistics. They were C numbers all the way through in parts of the case. Um, we started from the canonical theory, which was so we. I, I wouldn't say we. We did not impose both statistics at the level of going to the path integral. We imposed both statistics prior to going to the path integral. Namely, if you look at how we quantized our um, scalar field, even in this language, mm -hmm. we treated it as a, so let me turn off the coupling for a sec. We treated it as something made out of, where, where the, 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 the entire theory is constructed, the entire Fox space is constructed by A's and A daggers, mm -hmm. you know, acting on the vacuum. And we chose the most, I mean, the mm -hmm. commutator relations for the A's and the A daggers. So we chose both statistics at that point. Now, it wasn't a choice in the sense that it's the only thing that was consistent with, 
some very basic constraints that we would like to have in our relativistic theory. But I, at least in this part, I'm, I'm only pointing out that all our manipulations were on, you might say, gosh, when we did path integral, I didn't see that a or that a dagger. Well, you did, because you saw the, you saw the pi and the phi. Right? Yeah. And even this, so remember this tail from the P and the X in, in quantum mechanics, and the fact that we were writing states like E to the I, PX, the fact that it's this that gets generalized to this is saying that we've secretly been doing sort of like harmonic oscillator kind of um, particle physics. But harmonic oscillators, of course, have a kind of low statistics put in. Right? I mean, occupation, if you think of occupation, so we made this analogy, occupation number and the number of particles. If this is the harmonic oscillator corresponding to a momentum P state, we allow ourselves to fill it with 10 particles, all in the same momentum P state. So we, we have already completely drenched ourselves in both statistics before we even went to uh, path integral formulation. And we recovered all of the things about both statistics. For example, the Wicks theorem mm -hmm. that we derived is the Wicks theorem for both statistics that comes out of, so if you take this, and you, and you say that, what, what is phi, phi, phi? And you say, well, that's the same as delta, delta j, delta, delta j, acting on this. It automatically gives you the Bose version of the Wicks theorem, whereas there's a Fermi version of the Wicks theorem. And, and of course, we got out the Bose version. I claim it's not because we chose it in midstream while doing the path and roll. We, we chose it right before we started. So um, now our problem is we want to say, I chose this also to be a, um, I've chosen this to be the Fermi field. And, but we don't have the, we, we don't have this very simple analogy with a harmonic oscillator, except many harmonic oscillators. That, that's one way of thinking of this theory. It's many harmonic oscillators with perhaps some anharmonic terms treated as perturbations. We don't have that picture for this. Yeah, my, uh, yes, my confusion was that what turned <coughs> out here was we started with some uh, C numbers, and almost serendipitously we got uh, the Bose uh, Bose, uh, the Bose version of Wicks theorem. But, so there is no a priori motivation to, to say that when, I, uh, when I'm No, 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 I, 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 you say we, so, you said one, we started with some C numbers yes. and serendipitously got the, the Bose Wicks theorem. Yes. I want to say no to both of those. Okay. Let me try and point out where we first chose the path of Bose and mm -hmm. not from. And um, so we, when, when we started, we, we wrote this uh, Hamiltonian, which was this p squared over 2m plus v of q, or v of x. Uh, that was in the, in, in the quantum mechanics analogy. But then we turned this into integral v cubed x. And then we had this pi squared plus uh, V of phi, and this pi, so just like this p, can be thought of as minus i dx. I mean, that's what it is in this x representation. This pi was minus i delta delta phi. This was this this construct this was constructed on complete analogy with this, and. Uh, sorry, I forgot the gradient term. And for the purpose of this question, I can specialize just to show you the 
great clarity where the both statistics exist, I can uh, I can just just keep a mask term, just do free free field theory. Okay. And if I just Fourier transform only space, space is sort of just a label from this point of view, and just write it into the Q Q some momentum, then I can just work in terms of the Fourier transform pi. And here, I would just, so the only thing that going to Fourier space does is it makes it clear that this is a q squared phi squared. So that another way to write this is omega squared q If I had done the harmonic oscillator here, this would look like omega squared <coughs> m squared m is 1 for me. So m squared and then it would look like x squared, okay? And I'm saying this theory, we, we wrote this theory down and we, and we chose the commutator of pi and phi to be the one with pi, phi equals delta with those commutators there. And if I just use AA dagger language, Translate this. That was a a dagger equals delta. The instant we chose this to be delta, we chose this to be delta. If you want to work backwards, when we decided to do bosons for scalars, these linear combinations called pi and phi of a and a dagger turned out to have this commutation. And only